Hi again, I learned my lesson from last episode to only focus on one item at a time. Even if it only goes five minutes, is that really going to harm anyone? So t for this short installment, we're going to be talking a little bit about reading expectations. And I could go on for a long time on this, but this is the key to learning Greek well and reading it fluently and reading it like a native speaker or or like somebody who learned Greek the old-fashioned way by, by going to ancient Greece and coming into contact with text and also listening to speakers. And the, the key to expectation is what we call linear reading. And what this simply means is going from left to right, or I guess if you're doing Hebrew maybe, or Arabic, maybe right to left, but for Greek, for the way that Greek is now printed at least, we're going to be moving left to right. And what this means in time is, is moving in, in the order of speech. What this does, this linear reading, is opens up how things sounded to the Greeks and what they were expecting as they were listening to Demosthenes give a speech or a play of Euripides in the audience or a Homeric bard performing bits of the Odyssey. Uh, we get it into their mindset and we get to get a sense of the artistry and what expectations the author is leading us to have. This can be very artistic. This can also be very simple. The, you know, questions, answers, these things all have to deal with reading expectations. So one reason I'm going to go, well, have a short diversion here on, on making a short presentation is uh, there was an Alexandrian po poet uh, by Alexandrian, I mean from Alexandria. Well, there were many Alexandrias. Which one do I mean? I mean the center of culture and learning in North Africa at the mouth of the Nile. So this is the Egyptian Alexandria. And Callimachus, whose name we'll find out will mean, well, we already know this mock, don't we? Make. Battle. And this Kali is beautiful. So he is Mr. Handsome Battle. Beautiful battle. And he wrote what became the dominant aesthetic for a long time in kind of literary studies and literary writing. Mega Biblion. This is a good second declension neuter. It means book origin of the word Bible. Mega is an adjective that we'll get to in a little while, but it just means big. So big book, mega kakon, big evil. So the longer you go, the worse it's probably going to be. For Callimachus, it was all about a very narrow, finely polished piece of work. That's where artistry was for Callimachus. This is very much different from well, many authors in the Greek tradition, and especially Homer. Uh, Callimachus loved Homer, wrote in response to, but for his time, a mega biblion was a mega cacon. Apparently they were already an MTV generation and needed short things. But anyway, to get back to reading expectations, let's take an example English sentence. I don't want... Well, let's, let's start with I. <laughs> Let's make it really simple. What do we know about this sentence? Well, we know who the speak. We know it's being spoken by somebody. This isn't probably a computer or a company. This is a single person, first person singular, and then don't. Well, what do we know about don't? Well, a lot of things. Do not. So this is going to take a verb of some sort. I, uh, we couldn't say I don't telephone. Well, I guess we could, but then we would mean call. Um, I don't um, garbage disposal. No, we need a verb here. Um, so this is good. We already have some expectations about where this sentence is going to go. And then I don't like. Well, all right, so there's our verb. I don't, you know, have favorable impressions of. Well, this could go a couple ways, right? I don't like strawberries, maybe, or I don't like to, and what would that to mean? Well, this would probably be opening up an infinitive, and this infinitive and its verbal thing is probably going to come with a bit of a phrase. So with every word, 
constantly, all language speakers are doing these kind of game theory bifurcations in their head and are saying, well, which way is this going to go? What can I expect? Um, this means that if you know, you're listening and then a little bit of this gets scrambled and then you say, I don't like bear uris or, and then we have an infinitive phrase here, well, we'd be able to put this together because we we're already thinking, well, maybe we want a noun or maybe we want a phrase. Same thing is constantly happening in Greek, but Greek becomes a little bit more complicated uh, since it is a case language, a language that has nominative, genitive, dative. Uh, another way of writing this is as an inflected language, which English is only mildly inflected, where we have the kind of he, him distinction, etc. So when we have a case language, this reading expectation becomes a little bit more important because so much of English expectation, we just know that we're going to have a subject, a verb, and then some sort of direct object. For the Greeks, it was a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to take a sentence from the lesson. I'm not going to do what um, Shelmerdine has. And we're going to just play through and take uh, our, you know, make our judgments at every step of the way. So this is going to be top of page 32. Uh, and the, the phrase, the sentence is, Ho poietes u tois ergois. That's a new vocabulary word, but everything else should have been familiar. Tain makain. That's what we just had with Callimachus, right? Battle. And then the sentence continues. Epausen. Ala. Tois. Logois. Full stop. Good. I just picked this at random, and it's actually going to be very interesting. So let's diagram this a little bit. Ho poietes, nominative, masculine, first declension, not, uh, noun. Uh, grave accent, because it's followed by other things, but this is our subject, the poet. Ooh, a negative adverb, not. Toys, that kind of looks like toss, I'm sorry, that's a toys. Toys, okay, well, so what do we have here? Ho poietes, what can we expect? Well, this is nominative and singular. If the sentence is going to have a verb, which it most likely will, that's going to be third person singular. So it's, you know, it might end in a, it might end in e or n. Uh, if it's a aorist or imperfect, this is for future or present. We gotta keep our eye out. We can't judge our tense yet, but we know it's going to be third person singular. Ooh, well that doesn't really change anything other than that we know that this verb can be negated, but most can, so that's nothing. Toys. Well, we say, oh, this is this is masculine or neuter, and it's plural. And what else is it? It's dative. So we're looking for a masculine or neuter plural dative to follow. We get that with ergois. So immediately our expectation is satisfied. Toys ergois, the deeds. Uh, as often, this gets opposed in Greek thought to words. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? That's the kind of idea. This is the walking the walk. So the poet, not with the words, and again, this might be a class, just with words, tame, and then again, the article itself prompts many expectations that this is mainly that we're going to have a feminine accusative singular noun following, which again, immediately satisfied with mocking. So good, this is the battle. So what, now that we have an accusative, what does that suggest? Well, that's probably going to be a direct object since we don't have a preposition preceding it. This means that our verb is probably going to be what we'll call a transitive verb, a verb that takes a direct object. So the poet is going to be doing something to this battle we don't know exactly what this tois ergois could be. Uh, this could be, um, you know, a direct, indirect object, two or four of the words, but it's inanimate, or deeds, sorry, not words. It probably doesn't care. 
um, maybe this is a means or instrument that's probably given what we know about the kind of meaning of the word ergon, deed, action, uh, this is probably going to be the means, but we'll figure that, that out. So, and then finally, after Makane, at Pausen. So, past indicative augment, here's our stem, here's our tense marker with the PIA, we know that this is aorist, not future, and then here's that third person singular that we have predicted. New because there's a comma after it, and there's an alpha. Great. So our expectations are being matched. We're not being thrown off by anything. The poet, not with words. The battle stopped. So more fluidly, because in English we want subject, verb, direct object. The poet stopped the battle, not with words, but, forgot the accent there, but that's great, but, so now we have an adversative conjunction. So we know that this is going to be um, somehow flipped with the second cola, colon. And then tois, again, just like ergois, masculine or neuter. And then logois, and we know that is masculine. And then this is probably a parallelism, that we have the same grammatical function going on in each. Not with, word, not with deeds, but with words, because he was a poet after all, what else could he do? So the poet did not stop the battle with word, with deeds, sorry, but with words. Or maybe this ooh, we want to take it more closely with the, the deeds. So the poet stopped the battle, not with words, sorry again, <laughs> not with deeds, but with words. So this is a nice way of using reading expectations to guide our reading, thinking like an ancient Greek would have, as he was hearing this being spoken or read aloud by another Greek speaker, he was moving like this, just along through, um, much like we might have a sing-along Disney music video uh, with that ball bouncing from left to right. Uh, this wasn't a Sudoku where everything was on a, a chart and Greeks were putting it together like this. No, it was all linear and they were using expectations to make the best sense of what was coming and what had already happened at every turn. We do this constantly in English, but English with our rigid word order of subject, subject verb, direct object, makes this a little bit more, more, well not easier, well somewhat easier, more predictable at least. For the Greeks, you know, any of these items could be earlier or later, and especially for somebody who's a non-native speaker and trying to translate, we're always going to need to be asking ourselves, all right, I'm waiting to fill this verb slot. When's it coming? Subject, check. Uh, so this is one of those reasons, and uh, Greek isn't alone in this. If you're translating Greek, you really can't understand the full sentence until you get to that final period. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to do uh, you, uh, you know, United Nations transliteration or translation live in real time of Greek because you'd always have to wait for that full sentence to finish before you could really make a good English translation and make a clear case of, of what the Greek was saying. Good, I hope that was useful uh, and join me next time. I guess we'll be moving on to negatives ooh and may. That one can't take more than 10 minutes, I really promise. <laughs> take care all. I hope to see you soon.